and sip the coming joy. Well, good morning and happy Thanksgiving, Heartland. I hope you all get the chance to celebrate with friends and family this weekend and enjoy a great meal. I don't know about you, but uh, when I was growing up, uh, when the whole family would get together for Thanksgiving, I often had to sit at the kids' table. Anybody else get stuck at the kids' table? And I felt like I was stuck there for years. Like, even as an older teen, I was still just stuck at the kids' table. And you might find this weird, but I actually looked forward to the day that I could graduate from the kids' table to the grown-up table. Like, for me, there were just a few things in life, simple things maybe, that were, I, I felt like they were markers of maturity, signs that I was becoming an adult. And I remember they were things like, uh, I remember when my parents, they ordered me my first Big Mac, and I ate the whole thing. So I graduated from the Happy Meal to the, to the Big Mac meal. Or the day I got my learner's license and I could finally get behind the wheel of a car. Or the day I graduated from high school. And I always kind of had this idea that, that graduating from the kids' table to the grown-up table at Thanksgiving, that was another one of those markers. It's when you were finally considered to be a mature person. Uh, but here's the thing. When you finally get invited to sit at the grown-up table, you need to act like a grown-up. Uh, there's no bibs. There's no plastic cups. You drink from a glass, and there's no playing with your food. It's time to be mature. And so just like we all have things in our life where we mature and we graduate from one thing to the next, you might have a different list of things than I would have. Uh, today, I want to talk about this idea of graduating in gratitude. Graduating in gratitude. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to the book of Philippians. We are in a series about joy. We're in chapter one, and here's what we know already from Philippians 1, where we've already been, that this book was written by the Apostle Paul while he was in prison. He's, he's on death row, not knowing whether he would be acquitted or beheaded. He's on watch 24 hours a day, so that there's a Praetorian guard that watches him all day long, so he can't even use the bathroom in privacy. And while he's in prison, the church at Philippi, which was a church that Paul planted, they send him a financial gift. Uh, because back then, if you were in jail and you didn't have someone supporting you, you died. Because the, they didn't give you three square meals a day. And so you needed somebody to support you financially. And so Paul writes them this letter from prison to encourage them and to thank them for their gift. And so we'll pick it up at verse 3 and we're going to go to verse 6. Paul writes, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So when I was uh, first preparing for this message, Initially, the title of this sermon I chose was An Attitude of Gratitude, because it, it felt like attitude is important when it comes to this whole area of thanksgiving, uh, and plus it rhymed. So <laughs> for a, a pastor, what more can you ask for? Uh, but as I started working on this message, it became clear that gratitude is not just about attitude. That's part of it. You know, give thanks with a grateful heart. We used to sing that in church growing up. So attitude is part of it. But as I started writing it, this idea of maturing in gratitude came to the surface. And this picture of moving from the kid's table to the grown-up table of gratitude. And so I want to talk about different levels of gratitude and what I think the scriptures teach us on what it looks like to mature in gratitude. So this letter from Paul, it's, in, in a way, it's kind of a commencement speech. He's giving them some encouragement. He's exhorting them as they carry on in the faith. And these opening verses are all about thanksgiving. In my Bible, that's the heading over this section of Scripture, thanksgiving and prayer. And so that's where Paul begins. He begins by expressing praise and thanks. And he tells them that he is thankful to God for them. 
even though the Philippians, they, they probably already know how Paul feels about them. They, pro- they already know that he has deep affections and appreciation for them. It probably goes without saying, but Paul says it anyway, that he's thankful for them. You may have heard people use the phrase, you know my heart. You know, sometimes that's a phrase that people use perhaps to excuse their, their lack of expression. You know, I, I shouldn't have to tell you these things. You should just know my heart. Well, no, I don't know your heart. I'm not a cardiologist. You know, I told my wife when I married her that I loved her. So that should be enough, right? She should just know my heart now. <laughs> no. <laughs> She still needs to hear it, and frankly, so do I. And so Paul doesn't assume that the Philippian church knows his heart. He takes time to say, thank you. And this is what I think is the first, most simple, basic level of gratitude. I'm thankful for. This is gratitude 101. It's simply just saying what you are thankful for. It's looking at the blessings that God has given you, and it's saying, thank you. Gratitude starts here. This is kids' table gratitude. This is where we teach our kids when they're young to say thank you. Because when they leave the table after a meal, we tell them to say thank you. And we have to teach them this because gratitude is not something that comes natural. Saying thank you does not come natural. We have to remind them over and over and over again. And if you think it does come natural, then you've probably never fed a two-year-old. <laughs> there is nothing instinctive that makes your child appreciate the sacrifices you make to put food on the table. So gratitude is a learned habit. It's a practice. And notice how Paul says he thanks God every time he thinks of the Philippians. Every time he prays for them, he thanks God for them. Paul has made gratitude a regular habit of his prayer life. He's made it a practice. At our house, we have the practice of praying before we eat, and I'm sure many of you do the same. Uh, But sometimes I like to have a little bit of fun with my family when I pray before a meal. Uh, If everyone, let's say, comes to the table and everyone's very hungry and they they just want to start diving in and start start eating, Uh, which, by the way, if my kids sit down, they're not allowed to say they're starving. We don't talk, we don't use that phrase at our house. We don't say that we're starving because there are actually people in the world who are starving. You might be very hungry, but you're not starving. So we use the language, we're very hungry. You might even be hangry when you come to the table, but you're not starving. So they come to the table very hungry, And they're just ready to dive. They might even start dishing up their plate already. And I'll say, hang on, let's pray. And I'll just start praying real slow. (laughs) I'll just slow it right down. And I'll just start listing off things that I'm thankful for. Doesn't matter. Just whatever comes to mind. Whatever I can see in the room. Yeah, God, thank you for, thank you for running water. And thank you for the dog. And... And thank you for NMAX, gas, and electricity, which, which power and heat our house. And my kids are just like, ugh. <laughs> like, can, this, can this guy just pray for the food so we can eat? It's getting cold. So I really test their patience that way. It drives them nuts, and I love it. <laughs> and here's the thing. E- even though I'm, I'm having fun with them, I know I'm just testing their patience, I'm really listing off blessings in our lives that we, we normally take for granted and don't normally thank God for on a regular basis. You know, we need to be people who practice gratitude. Paul continues in verse 4. He says, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. So notice here, Paul is also praying with joy. He's praying with a, a joyful thankfulness. And I think what he's doing is is Paul is showing us that gratitude and joy go hand in hand. That there is a direct connection between gratitude and joy. And that gratitude can actually be a, a pathway for us to experience joy. Paul prays with thankfulness and it it leads to joy. Because it's hard to be thankful and not be joyful at the same time. You know? 
A thankful heart is a joyful heart. Because you see, God's gifts alone are not able to bring you joy. God's gifts by themselves are not able to bring you joy. You only have joy when it is joined with gratitude. Because we can be surrounded with so many gifts, success, accomplishments, comforts, good things. But if you don't know how to turn the blessing into praise, it can turn into pride. And you won't have a joyful heart, but you'll have a prideful heart, an entitled heart, a heart that says, I, I deserve this. And for those of us that feel like we're lacking joy in our life, perhaps instead of searching for joy, we need to start practicing gratitude. Maybe what we need in our life isn't more accomplishment or more accumulation, but more appreciation for the things we already do have. I mean, how many of us are walking in blessings that used to be our prayer requests? And when was the last time you stopped to thank God for that? Because if you grow in gifts, but you don't grow in gratitude, what have you gained? And for some of us, we have more blessing than we've ever had, and yet we're the most joyless we've ever been. And there have been studies over and over that show the happiest people are not the ones who have the best of everything, but they're the ones who make the most of everything they do have. And you know this is true. I know this is true. We've all met someone who has way less than we do, who is way more joyful. So I actually want to give us a moment this morning to pause and to practice gratitude, a moment of thankful reflection. Because gratitude without practice, I think, is like faith without works. It's not alive. So just for a few moments, for you just to fill in this blank. This is Gratitude 101. This is God I'm thankful for. See, no matter what our circumstance is this morning, for all of us, I know we can all fill in something in this blank, that we can all be thankful for something. It might be, thank you for the clothes on my back. Thank you for the roof over my head. Thank you for the friends in my life. Thank you for the grace you gave me when I failed this week. Thank you for the freedom to worship in a place where we're not persecuted. Thank you for the crazy family that you've given me. Thank you for big answers to prayer. Thank you for small answers to prayer. And so I would encourage you to take a moment, and you might even want to write it down. You could use the sermon insert or you can use, you know, the notes app on your phone. You can revisit that this week. So let's just take a moment and consider what we're thankful for. Paul continues on in verse 5. He says, He is thankful for the Philippians because of their partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So I want you to, to think about that, that Paul is thankful not just for past blessings, not just for what God has done, but he's thankful in the present moment. He's thankful even now, sitting in prison, for the Philippians and for their partnership in the gospel. Paul is saying, I'm thankful even in my current circumstance. That I'm thankful despite being locked up. I'm thankful even though I might die tomorrow. And I think this shows us something unique about praise and thanksgiving in every moment of life. 
not just when it's easy to be thankful. You know, the Psalms are, are the language of praise and thanksgiving, and, and Psalm 23 is one of my favorite Psalms. I, I love the phrases that David uses in this Psalm. He says, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside quiet waters, he refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You see, David didn't write this psalm while he was experiencing the blessing and provision from God. David wrote this when he was in a valley. You see, the first level of gratitude, it teaches us to be thankful for the blessings God has given us. And this next level teaches us to praise and thank God even though. To be thankful even though. Where David says, even though I walk through the darkest valley. You see, thanking God for his blessings, for what he's given us, that's kid's table gratitude. That's where it begins. That's where we first learn and and we teach our kids to be grateful. But we aren't supposed to stay there. I mean, it would be weird if every Thanksgiving, if I made my way back to the kids' table. You know, I've got to grow up. It's easy to be thankful when we've already experienced the provision, when we've already received the blessing, but it's hard to be thankful when we're in the valley, when our circumstances don't call for Thanksgiving. It's when we're in the midst of pain and and struggle and uncertainty. The kids' table is where we thank God for what we can see, And this table is where we learn to trust God with what we can't see. Paul is in prison and he doesn't know whether he will live or die, but he's practicing gratitude and he says he's thankful for all of it from the first day right up until now. And in this, we see mature gratitude. See, because mature gratitude, I don't think it's just thanking God for what he's given you. That's just manners, That's just politeness. That's sitting at the kids' table. Thank you. That's basic, that when he blesses you, you thank him. When he provides for you, thank him. Give thanks to the Lord, for he has been good to you. That's basic. But maturing in gratitude means that we're able to say, I'm thankful even though being able to thank God in every season, in every circumstance, is a sign of maturity in Christ. You know, it was Paul who said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the same guy who wrote Philippians, he says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And here Paul is practicing what he preaches. He's thankful in all circumstances. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the kind of Christian who only thanks God when he's serving me, who only thanks God when I'm experiencing his blessing, who only gives thanks after I've received the gift. You know, am I only going to thank him when I have evidence of his goodness? Am I only going to thank him when I can see the provision? Or can I be thankful even though? And this level of gratitude isn't easy because when, when we're in the midst of the most difficult moments of life, I'll be the first to admit, my first thought is, is not thanksgiving. My first thought is, is, get me out of here, help. And this is the point where many turn away from God, where, where they actually get up and leave the table, because if God loved me, he certainly wouldn't let anything bad happen to me. But that is a, a false view of God. The reality is that none of us are exempt from walking through valleys. I'm convinced most of life is a valley with very few mountaintop experiences. And I bet for all of us, we all have something that we could fill in this blank, that God, I'm thankful even though. I'm thankful even though. Even though I don't know where the provision is going to come from this month. God, I'm thankful even though I got a bad health diagnosis. God, I'm thankful even though life isn't going the direction I'd like it to. 
God, I'm thankful even though I'm experiencing physical pain on a daily basis. God, I'm thankful even though my marriage is in crisis. I'm thankful even though I've lost loved ones along the way. I'm thankful even though I'm walking through a dark valley. This is the place where we learn to praise God even though. That when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say that it is well with my soul. So again, I just want to give you a moment to express gratitude to God and to thank him even though, to consider what what is the even though that you are carrying in your life today. So just take a moment to consider that. And again, I'd encourage you, if you'd like to write that down, let's just pause for a moment to consider, I'm thankful even though. Paul finishes this section of thanksgiving in in verse 6. He says, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So this level of gratitude is saying, I'm thankful because. I'm thankful because. See, we can thank God for his blessing. That's level one. We can even thank God despite our circumstances. That's maturity in in gratitude. But can we even go one step deeper to thank God because of our circumstances? See, I'm thankful because acknowledges that God has a purpose for the circumstances that I'm in. We don't praise him for the pain, but we praise him for what the pain is producing in us. We don't thank him for all things, but we thank him in all things. I praise him because he has a purpose for my circumstances. It's, it's teaching me. It's helping me become more like Christ. This circumstance that I'm in is producing something in me. And, and we've, we've looked at James chapter 1 before. We, we know this passage. But it's so relevant again where James says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be what? Mature and complete, not lacking anything. You see, he's not saying consider the trial pure joy because pain is pain. Pain is not joy. Pain is pain. But he's saying, consider it joy because of what the trial is producing in you. That God is doing a work in your life and he will carry it on to completion. And I just feel like so often when we walk through times of of sorrow or grieving, we just want a quick fix for it. We just want to be done with it and just to move on to joy. But we don't realize that the work that God does might take some time. You know, it's, it's not microwaved faith. It's, it's crockpot faith. <laughs> it might take longer than we'd like it to. But God is doing something in that. That there's a greater purpose for the circumstances you're in. It's a confidence of knowing that God doesn't waste anything and that the work that he's doing in you, that he will finish. And so again, I, I just want to give us a brief moment just to express Thanksgiving, just to say, God, I'm thankful because. And and that might sound like this. It might sound like, God, I'm thankful because I know I can trust you with the future. 
I'm thankful because I know you keep your promises. I'm thankful because even though I can't see it right now, I don't understand it, I know you're doing a work in me that will one day be complete. God, I'm thankful because I know that you work all things together for the good of those who love you. So let's just take one more moment to express gratitude to God. I'm thankful because... Well, just as I, I wrap up, you know, th- these two things, joy and sorrow, uh, th- they're two very opposite experiences that we have in life. And yet in Scripture, there seems to be a unique connection between the two. And I don't claim to know exactly how they weave together, but, but I want to share with you this interesting passage from Psalm 126 where it says that those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. That those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. So this is a metaphor in which your sorrow and your tears, when sown properly, can bring you a harvest of joy. And there are two implications of this. First of all, this is telling us that it's actually possible to waste your sorrows. Imagine if a farmer goes out with a bag of seed and he's supposed to scatter it all over, but instead he just dumps it all in one spot. Well, that would be a waste of seed. There might be a few things that grow in that spot or there might be nothing, but it would be a total waste. And so it's possible to sorrow and to grieve in such a way that it doesn't produce any fruit in your life at all. In other words, you can just, <clears throat> you can just cry and yell and scream and dump all of your tears out and not see any fruit from that. And so it's possible to waste your sorrows. Secondly, the most intriguing part of this idea is that joy is actually produced by the sorrow. See, we all hope and believe that joy will follow sorrow in our life. And there are passages in the Bible that talk about that, that sorrow may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And so most of us, when we're in sorrow, that's what we hope for, that after the sorrow is done, that God will usher in joy in our life again. But this goes beyond that. This is not just saying that joy follows sorrow, but that joy is actually produced by sorrow. And what it can mean is that sowing seeds of sorrow, that when they're sown properly, can produce joy in your life. That it can make you a more joyful person in the long run. Well, how can that possibly be? Well, we don't know what the psalmist knew when he wrote this, but what we know is this. That if you look to Jesus, this can come true. That Jesus is the ultimate example of someone who brought joy out of sorrow. Jesus literally brought us joy out of his weeping. That his agony and sorrow was substitutionary. That he stood in our place. And therefore, when he took our punishment, his weeping was the ultimate sowing in tears. And it brought the ultimate harvest of joy. And if you keep your eye on the cross, when you suffer, your sorrows will not be wasted. You begin to rejoice in God rather than your circumstances. Because our circumstances will always let us down. 
But by looking to the cross, it should lead us to a response of gratitude, which leads us to joy and the hope of a joy that will last forever because of what Christ has done for us, that one day God will wipe every tear, he will right every wrong, and there will be no more sorrow, just eternal joy in his presence. Amen. Let's pray together. Oh well, God, thank you so much for your word today and for the reminder of how much we have to be thankful for. May we not take your blessings and provision in our lives for granted, but would you help us to be people who practice gratitude for the things that we already have. And for some of us who may be in a valley or in a, a difficult season of life, help us to be thankful even though our circumstances are not what we'd want them to be. And help us to not miss the work that you're doing in us, in the midst of the trial, in the, in the midst of the pain, that with our sorrow, we would be able to sow seeds that bring long-term joy. And God, for those of us here or who might be listening that may not have a relationship with you, perhaps receiving Jesus is their first step toward gratitude in acknowledging who you are and what you've done on the cross. And that if that's you today, you can begin a relationship with Jesus with this simple prayer of saying, Jesus, I give you my life. That's all it takes. Jesus, I give you my life. We thank you for this time and we submit to your lordship and we pray in your name. Amen. Well, if you would like prayer this morning, we have a team over by the cross here that would love to pray with you. If you came prepared to give, there is a lockbox by guest services where you can drop your tithe or your offering. Uh, stick around for a few minutes because we've got some very delicious uh, apple coffee cake with some whipped cream on top in the foyer, so please take advantage of that. And uh, if uh, you, you're comfortable, I invite you to stand. We always like to end our service with a, a blessing. And so I would like to, uh, to bless you with this, and you can hold your hands out to receive that, again, if you're comfortable. So may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, that you may abound with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Happy Thanksgiving.